I think we're about ready to start. Uh, everyone enjoying the show so far? Yeah. All right. Glad to hear it. All right. Uh, when I knew some of these gentlemen would be attending the show, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to organize a panel, and David agreed with me. Uh, so here we have a kind of more of a roundtable discussion on uh, what it's like in the very strange world of uh, bringing your, your vintage tech and vintage computer hobby uh, to YouTube. And so uh, I have a couple of topics here, and then uh, after a while, uh, we will definitely be opening up to audience questions. So uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand when the mics start going around. Uh, and without further ado, I guess we should, uh, we should just get started. One of the things that uh, intrigues me is that YouTube is, it takes a lot of work to do this kind of stuff. Uh, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of scripting. And uh, actually, I kind of wanted to start with, uh, with Clint, if that's all right with you. Um, you guys have all been doing this for 10 years or more. And what is it specifically about um, doing it in video format? What it, like, you could have done this with a website, or a blog, or a podcast. A lot of people do this with a podcast. Why video? Is this thing on? Uh, yeah. Uh, mainly because I just enjoyed the whole video making process more than the other things. Like I had actually tried to do uh, audio only and a blog and all these other things at one point. And uh, as soon as video online became viable, that was really the turning point there because it was just a mixture of all the other things I enjoyed doing. So it was the fact that uh, really sites like YouTube came along all around at the same time as a bunch of others, you know, blip.tv and things that have just died. I uh, had my stuff on Google TV or whatever it was, Google Video at first. And uh, yeah, YouTube came along and made, made a lot of sense because I was already doing the other things and figured why not combine them with this new platform on the web. Yes. Ken, what about you? You've been doing this for a while too. I'm not sure if a lot of people. I'm not sure if a lot of people know that that you've uh, been on YouTube quite a while too. Actually, in a few days, it is our 14th birthday on YouTube, so we've been around a while. <laughs> there was um, there was no rhyme or reason or any science behind why I chose video as opposed to you know written blogs or whatever. I just remember when I was a kid, I was probably five years old, using my dad's little uh, Sony camera that he used to film all the home movies. I remember looking through that viewfinder, that nice like blue monochrome viewfinder, and like everything that would happen on there would happen also in real life. I was like, wow, this is like really cool. I can't explain it. I'm only five years old, but uh, it sparked the whole video thing. And uh, well, hey, it got me here, so it worked. <laughs> David, what about you? Well, um, my story is obviously a little different since I started my YouTube channel primarily as a means to advertise a computer business I had, which obviously most of those videos aren't even on there anymore because you know, because <laughs> so, you have a completely different business now. Yeah, yeah. So, so how did it uh, morph from? I mean, at some point, you, it started morphing away from advertising your business to just doing stuff you enjoyed doing. It, do you, was there like a catalyst? For well, that, yeah. Or? So I was doing the iBook videos just, again, to kind of drive video uh, traffic to my, my website to sell my refurbished iBooks. And um, even after I quit doing that business, because when the iPad came to the market, it pretty much killed the used iBook slash used MacBook business. So I just, it was a weekend job for me anyway. It wasn't like my main job. So I'm just like, okay, I'm done with this. But people kept asking me, make more videos, make more videos. We really love those videos. I'm like, okay, I'll, so every now and then I'd make a few more. But then I kind of ran out of ideas for topics. And then one day somebody told me, hey, you can monetize your channel. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so I tried that and I was like, wow, I made like 50 bucks this month. Hey, you know, this could be my new side job, but I can't think of any more videos to make for iBooks. Maybe I can think of something else. So I experimented with a number of different channels and everything from the Mad Scientist channel to, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, and it just seemed like the 8-Bit Guy channel worked better for me and my area of expertise. Well, to be completely honest, I wouldn't have thought people would even be interested in that stuff. That's probably why I didn't focus on it immediately, because I'm like, nobody else cares about that stuff. But I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people felt that way and were really surprised when uh, stuff started taking off. Um, you guys have been doing this a long time. You've had a lot of different projects. 
Uh, I think your success is a lot of your audience knows, but uh, I would like to know if any of you guys had any projects that were disappointing, any projects that you <laughs> worked, David's already laughing, um, anything, that, anything where you, you were enthusiastic about it, you put uh, a lot of work and effort into it, and now Clint's laughing. Um, so I think you know it, but actually, since I think I know what David's going to say, is there, are there any projects that, that you were disappointed by their, by their reception? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's obviously a lot that I was disappointed in. In fact, it's uh, every YouTuber I've talked to um, has confirmed with me the same thing. Like some of the projects you're most excited about that you put the most work into and you think this is going to be the best thing ever winds up like nobody likes it. It's not that nobody likes it. It's just like no, no, nobody watches it. Nobody gets excited about it. And then you'll throw some little thing out that you spent like three days working on. You think, oh, well, this is some filler material. And it ends up being like one of your most popular videos ever. So that kind of thing happens all the time. But I have a number of videos I've never even finished, probably at least a dozen that I've spent, you know, maybe two weeks working on that I'm like, I'm never going to finish this for various reasons, like technical problems or just, you know, one of the more recent ones, I bought a Sinclair C5 like a year ago. I was going to do, that's that little electric car that Clive Sinclair made. And I spent a lot of money importing that from the UK too. And it would end up getting crushed by DHL and I've been trying to fix it up and finally at some point I just stuck it in storage and I'm like I don't know that I'm ever coming back to that so it was like half filmed and you know I got little examples like that all over the place and I'm sure every youtuber does <laughs> uh, you wouldn't be the first person to be disappointed by Sir Clive's uh, <laughs> bike so not no big loss there uh, Ken I know that you've been surprised by the success of some of your scam tech videos but uh, is there anything you put, same, same question, is there anything you put a lot of work into that didn't quite go over as, as you'd hoped? There was one uh, semi-recently, it wasn't really retro tech based because it was about the new iPhone when the new iPhone 12 came out. And being a video guy, I was really excited about like the Dolby Vision features and all that stuff. So I worked really hard with my friend to go on location and film with the iPhone like next to a real camera, actually a black magic right there so we would film all this cool stuff and I thought oh this is gonna be the coolest video ever we got all this cool lighting and all these cool things nobody gave a crap like nobody the the video performance like I changed the thumbnail and title that's a good trick like if your videos not working change the thumbnail and title and then it actually started taking off again but we did a sequel to it and it just nose dives so but you know yeah you live and learn you move on flew like a lead balloon huh yeah <laughs> yeah it's the world's not ready for hlg and uh, hdr I, on youtube yet i did have to explain a lot of that stuff to people because even i was confused as to how hdr really worked uh, so i did make a separate video it got a little more views but it explained all the intricacies of hdr and wow it is a, it is a cluster f yes it is <laughs> it is maybe in five years we'll get there yeah it'll it'll, it'll get there yeah uh clint i I have to put you on the spot and ask you as well. Is there any project you thought was going to go great and for some reason it just didn't? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I've been sitting here racking my brain trying to think of the main project that just flopped and there's too many of them that I always, you know, I just, uh, going back however many years ago doing some of my most enjoyable times making videos, those are the ones that do seem to fall apart. When I'm just being myself in front of a camera and there's no script, there's no research, and I just, I always wanted those to do a little better. Like I used to do these plays videos where I could just talk about a game and, you know, have that, or I'd have somebody on as a collaboration and we would just have fun. Because I saw so many other channels doing that. This is like, eight or nine years ago, and they were successful. I'm like, yeah, I could do that, and nobody cared ever, uh, at least relative to the other things, and it was uh, just videos that took off that I never expected. Uh, like Doom on a calculator was done in like an afternoon, and that's the most popular video I've done now, and I don't know why. Uh, I'll never, ever understand it. <laughs> but, you know, put Doom on anything, and it's going to work, I guess. So, yeah, it's try not to chase that too much and try not to think about, you know, which, uh, which thing is going to do well or not. Like I recently did a video on Print Shop Deluxe and I could talk about that for hours, but relative to other videos, you know, YouTube comes up and says, this video is doing 40% worse. Good job. Don't do that ever again. 
please don't ever talk about print shop again. So I guess I won't. But now, I like the, if you listen to that, then it just gets too discouraging. So I think that's been more of the, the learning experience of the last few years for me is to uh, just power through those failure moments and not even think about it. Because if you want to go by analytics, almost every video is a failure according to YouTube. So in some way or another. There's always down arrows. It's always telling you something did way worse. Don't ever do it again. I'm hearing a lot of accidental successes here. Is there, do you guys have like a grand plan to the type of stuff you do? Or is it really month to month like, oh, this sparks my interest and I'm going to do that again. David, what about, uh, what about you? Do you have like a Ugh. huge long list of projects, yeah. or are you kind of like, I'm just going to do what I've always been doing, which is stabbing in the dark and seeing what works? No, I have a long list. And I'm not of... suggesting you stab in the dark <laughs> to see what works. I have a long list of video projects that, you know, it's probably about 200 lists long of topics, and even a lot of those are partially scripted. And every time I am ready to make a new video, well, actually, I'm, I'm always working on more than one at a time anyway. Like, I'm working on one now, I'm planning for the next, and, and I'm ordering stuff for the next. And, yeah, I usually have about three or four that kind of in the pipeline. But when it's time for me to pick a new video, I usually look through the list, and I'm like, you know, what, can, what do I have that I can make something like, because every one of these videos requires some prerequisites, some thing that has to be filled, some um, dependency, like I need to order this for that, or I, I need to fix this thing before I can make that, and, and, and so on. And so it's always really complicated trying to figure out what can I actually make next. And so that's usually how it works. It's not necessarily what I'm most excited about. But there are occasionally just things I make on a whim, like, Somebody will offer to send me something I'll have for a limited amount of time, and uh, some of those have gone well and some of those haven't. Uh, and, like the IBM video didn't go too well. That was something I was handed for like, you know, I had that for like 48 hours, and I'm like, let's see if we can make a cool video about that. And, you know, sometimes that doesn't work out so well, but the planned videos tend to work out a little, little bit better because I try to have all the stuff ready for, you know, when I do it. So. Ken, I'm going to ask the same question of you, but I think uh, a lot of your stuff is topical, so you probably do kind of have a good idea of what you're going to work on. Is that a good guess? It's uh, usually, yeah, it is topical, but it is like really month to month. Like I'll have a, in my project management software, I have a huge list of things I can pick from in terms of topics if I, if, I don't know, if news or something is really dead for a while or I don't get a donation or I don't see some cool thing on eBay I spend a lot of money on. If there's like a kind of like a dry period, I'll just pull from a list and be like, all right, I'll do an episode about that. But usually something cool comes up once or twice within a month and I can hop on a video about that and script it and get it ready to go in about a week and a half, two weeks. Cool. Clint, same question? Uh, yeah, nothing is planned ever. And it really is just a matter of if something grabs my attention long enough to want to spend the next like 30 to 60 hours of my life on it, uh, you know, outside of just messing around with it and having fun with it. It usually starts with that. I'll just be, you know, acquiring something recently or I will look at what I call uh, my shelf of shame and it's all, it's, it's just like a six foot tall shelf full of projects that I keep telling myself and my audience that I'm going to do. And there's always, like David was saying, is a piece missing or some other aspect of it that would make it like 10 times better in my mind. So I'm still waiting on something to show up and then, you know, I get that and then the scope gets out of control and then I never do it and it stays on the shelf. Uh, but yeah, every time I'm thinking of something to do, it's a mixture of uh, looking at my, my ongoing plan, so to speak, which is just things that I think are cool. And then uh, whatever that week I kind of spent the most time on, and then uh, by default, that becomes the video because Friday is coming up. <laughs> so, yeah. That's right. You commit to a regular schedule. Yeah, it's all yeah, Friday schedule, but sometimes not. Sometimes it's okay to be yeah. sometimes not. Yeah. Uh, so this is a lot of planning. Uh, can each of you say briefly roughly how many projects you have in the pipeline at any given time? One, two, zero, because you have, don't plan at all anything. No idea. I no, no idea. idea. Really. I have no idea. It's a lot. Like, I, I do keep a notebook full of just project ideas, but it's pages and pages and pages and pages. Oh, really? And, and so you're kind of working on them. everything yeah, kind I, of simultaneously? Like, I'll wake up someday and I'm like, you know what? I need to do some IBM research and let me see what's on the IBM page. 
and then I'll just feel like, I don't know, it really is a kind of a whim thing for me, which is uh, not a good idea. I don't recommend it, but it really works for my brain. So, <laughs> like, like six hours later, you're still researching, and you're like, I yes. guess that's this week's video. That's exactly it. Okay. If I find myself stuck in a mental rut and I can't talk about anything else this week, then that's it. Yeah. Ken, David, uh, how deep are your project uh, lines? I usually try to keep it one at a time. I do release every other week, so I have two weeks per video. Uh, so I try to keep it one at a time. But when I'm doing the tech like scam debunking investigations, those are usually like three or four running at a time because it can take months to do the research for that. And sometimes I'm waiting for people to reply to me. You know, I'm tr waiting for something to get shipped from South Korea or something, and it takes forever. So when it comes to the scam stuff, yeah, there's usually about four of those in the hopper at a time. But everything else is usually every two weeks, get one done, move to the next. So David, what we about you? We have a fourth panelist now. There's like a quarter-sized spider just crawled across the... Oh, cool. Hi, I spider. I don't know where he went now. <laughs> where um, is it now? I, I don't know. I, I, I looked away. <laughs> you never seen that in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> no, we have brown recluses in Texas. So. Well, look at the bright side. You might be able to, uh, be able to sling webs and uh, climb the wall yeah. if it bites you. So, much like I alluded to earlier, I typically have about three in the pipeline at any given time, but I always have focus on, like, one particularly and then I've got two that I'm kind of half working on you know cool. so yeah cool. uh, sometimes uh, YouTube makes accidental stars out of people I think uh, all of you might sort of qualify for that uh, unless you went into it for fame and fortune I don't think so no. um, just uh, on that note, a ton of people come to me wanting to start a YouTube channel, and that's like one of the first talks we have. Like, you do not want to do it trying to get popular. That'll make you really depressed really fast. Yeah. <laughs> well, and your, and your content will suffer, too. If yep. you're trying to please what you think people want and not look at your analytics to know what people actually want. Um, I was curious if any of you guys had any stories about uh, uh, being recognized in public, good or bad. Mm, yes. Yes, How about I sure you, do. Why don't you start? Good, good, bad? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was about two years ago. It was right before all the pandemic stuff. And you could still go out to restaurants. I went out to a restaurant, and this guy was staring at me across the room very intently. <laughs> and he wouldn't stop. I'm like, all right, this is interesting. So, uh, yeah, just kind of went to the end of the night and started cleaning up. <laughs> went to the bathroom, and all of a sudden there's a man standing very close to me at the urinal. I'm like... It was just, it, it was so great. The only thing he said, he wasn't even going himself. He just kind of looked at me and said, I love your videos. <laughs> and, then he, and then he left and that was it. <laughs> and that really made an impact. I, my, <laughs> my day was changed and my life has never been the same. <laughs> Soon we'll see the LGR security detail. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, uh, David, any uh, further thoughts? I mean, I, I don't know if I can top that. Uh, I, I, usually, I usually try to stay under the radar a bit in terms of like people recognizing me in person. Of course it happens, uh, but uh, I try to keep it kind of low because I don't want to constantly be stared at from across the room and followed into the bathroom. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing it's more uncomfortable than uh, pleasant, I guess. Honestly, no. If, well, sorry. For me, like, it's super comfortable most of the time, like 99% of people. But then you get, like, you're an old guy. <laughs> right. I, I, I'll totally agree. Honestly, like, some people come up to me and they, they feel like they're bugging me. But I'm like, no, hey, come on. It's totally fine. I, I, I love doing that. But, yeah, if, if you get urinal guy, though, that's, that you don't want. <laughs> It, it must be, I mean, at, at least in an event like this, you expect them to come up. And oh, yeah. Play, so that must this be is great. a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, David, I hesitate to ask the same question to you because you willingly invite fans over to see you. That takes that is, balls. <laughs> <laughs> I have probably had between, I'm, I've lost track. I want to say probably about 500 people come by my house over the last five years. Um, just, and you know. nothing has gone wrong. No. No, I think and I well off. probably because I also know you are a registered gun owner. <laughs> <laughs> it's Texas. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, but to, to answer your original question, actually, I get recognized all the time. But probably, I probably get recognized more than Clint simply because I live in a big metropolitan area, so there's just a lot more people there to yeah, run you're into. You're on camera a lot more than I am, honestly. What's you're that? in camera like almost all your videos too. So I think that because for me, more people recognized my computers. Your voice out there than me so far, which is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say your um, voice is a dead giveaway. Yeah, however. voices too. Yeah. I think that's how rec restaurant But I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories. So <laughs> one, um, 
when I was in Germany, in uh, for I don't know how many people you saw it. It was on my Eat Keys channel. I went to the Toman facility in the. It was this, this little town in the middle of Germany. Like it's an hour away from any civilization. It's and there's like, you can walk from one end of the town to the other in like sixty seconds. I mean, it's like really tiny little town. There's a little hotel there, and I was staying in that. And of course, they had invited a bunch of YouTubers over to do this event. And so a lot of us YouTubers got together in this little pub that was in like the third story of this little hotel. And we were just, you know, talking and whatnot that evening before the next day of work. And this guy comes over to me and recognizes me. And he's like, um, you know, hey, can I get your you know, autograph or whatever? And I'm like, OK. And so I thought he was either a Tomon employee or he was one of the other YouTubers that I didn't know because there were like 30 of them there and I didn't know them all. Or I thought maybe he was one of the, because they brought in like people from like Korg and Yamaha and, and you know, all these like, uh, what do you call reps or whatever. And I thought maybe he was one of those guys. So anyway, uh, so I asked him, you know, hey, am I going to see you tomorrow at Toman? And he's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, what are you here for in Treppendorf in the middle of nowhere? He's like, oh, we're having a wedding in front of that castle tomorrow. And uh, I just came up here and I saw you and I'm like, <laughs> like <laughs> in the most of, he's like, this is the last place I ever expected to see you. And, and so anyway, I can, I've been recognized in some pretty unusual places like that. But I, I usually am always very happy to talk to anybody who wants to come by and talk to me. The only, I, I feel bad because there was like this one time I was at the airport and I was waiting on an Uber driver and he called me and it turns out he was like on a different level. And I was like, oh, rats. So I go inside and I'm running up the escalator and some guy stops me and he's like, hey, are you the Uber guy? And I'm like, I got like 10 seconds to get to my Uber or the security guys are going to run them off. Sorry, bye. <laughs> and I, ran off. I felt bad about that. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's very inconvenient, but most of the time it's not. <laughs> you could have blown the uh, Germany's uh, guy's mind by speaking to him in German. Had you thought of <laughs> oh, it at I the did. Time. Oh, you did oh. speak to him in German. Awesome. <laughs> very cool. Um, I know a lot of people who get into vintage tech uh, do so because they have a love for the hobby because it's what they did before they started making YouTubes. It was their career or something along those lines. Um, I know, Clint, you've had even more of kind of a, a, a more interesting history. I believe you were a framer at one point. Yeah, I frame people for crimes. For crimes. <laughs> I, what, I, what I'm getting at is, I'm, I'm curious, if you guys never started making YouTube videos, if it was not your, your primary or one of your primary income sources, what do you think you'd be doing today? More tech work or something completely different? I've, uh, yeah, I used to play a bunch of instruments a lot more. I don't know, maybe I'd be a SoundCloud master or something like that, making, dropping my hot new mixtapes or uh, probably voice acting. I've done a lot of voice work on like a freelance basis and I'd probably pick that up full time if I wasn't doing YouTube. Because right now it's really hard to freelance when you got your own stuff going on all the time. But yeah, probably something in the audio music world. So do you make uh, your own background music for your videos? I used to until I realized it takes a lot of time. So but no I, content claim ID ever. So a uh, shameless plug for Artlist.io, that is the subscription service I use for music. No content claims. <laughs> Never had a single one. <laughs> David, what about you? Do you think oh, you'd I'm still sure be I, doing tech support? I'd, well, I haven't worked in tech support. Well, you know what I mean. Or, time, pro, but or I, programming or something. Um, I'll yeah, crawl I mean, into a hole now. I mean, when I, my last job that I quit, like, uh, what is that, three years, three, four years ago now? I mean, I worked there for 11 years in the IT department. I'd probably still be there. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Clint, what about you? Any ideas? Yeah, I don't know. I was just doing framing because it was a job. Uh, I mean, I kind of ended up enjoying it, so I like doing any kind of work with my hands at all. So if I could, you know, uh, get into building picture frames for a living, honestly, it, it was kind of appealing at that point. But yeah, it was just something that I was doing. Uh, I was trying to go to school for graphic design at the time, so I just ended up hopping over from that because we had a, an Adobe Premiere kind of aspect to that and they're like let's learn some video stuff too and I'm like well this is way more fun than static images so uh, yeah I really don't know I have no idea because it just sort of happened at the right time where videos started to make sense and uh, everything else made less sense so I, I don't know I don't know. maybe you'd be making videos about uh, sketch comedy uh, yeah maybe yeah, maybe maybe um, it's interesting to hear that uh, there's an artistic bent here and maybe that's some of the appeal of uh, of uh, working in a visual medium. Um, 
I think I want to turn it over to the to the audience. That's uh, pretty soon. Uh, show of hands. Do we have any questions? Okay, that's not going to be a problem. Um, and one of the things I think they're going to ask is, is something I also want to ask, um, and you probably get it asked a lot, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, what was the project that got away? What's your holy grail project you'd love to do, but you just haven't been able to make it work? Uh, you haven't been able to obtain the thing, or the person you wanted to interview died, or <laughs> that, that has happened. Um, you know, and the information died with them. I mean, is there, um, Ken, what about you? Is there anything you've, you've really wanted to do, but it's eluded you? This is going to be a really disappointing answer, but no, there currently is not. Um, but, you know, I don't want to make it seem like I know everything, because I definitely don't. But one thing I do know is if you got to be a go-getter, like if I have a project that I really want to do, I'm just going to do it. Like when I, when I went to, when I wanted to go to California and film cool stuff and show cool computers, I just called this guy that owned this tech museum and I was like, hey, can we do a thing and like boom I was on a plane like the next month filming stuff so you just don't want to wait I, I know timing doesn't always work out but the longer you sit on a project it's most likely not gonna be able to get completed it's fair David what about you anything you've really wanted to do but it's just eluded you well besides the Amiga thing that everybody keeps asking about <laughs> but I will do that one someday so no, I think there's this one video that I've been wanting to do forever, but I just don't think it's going to be humanly possible because I cannot find the information that I want. I would love to be able to show video clips from all the old sci-fi movies from like the 70s and the early 80s where they have like, whether it'll be like a spaceship and there's like a computer screen or something and, and then tell people like, what did they, what was that inside there? Like was, you know, what kind of computer was generating that image and just show all these different movies. But the trouble is I'll Google and Google and Google. And unless, I don't know, unless I could actually literally get a hold of the directors of some of these, which are probably all dead now, I'll never find out what these computers were they used. I mean, like for example, like in um, 1980s Doctor Who, what, what did they use to run the screens in the TARDIS? You know, that kind of stuff, you know. I have a long la laundry list of stuff like that I'd love to know. And you can find bits and pieces of information there, but not enough to make the whole video. And then, so it's frustrating, but that's something I'd love to be able to do. Besides, you don't want to learn that the TARDIS is powered by a BBC Micro. <laughs> Clint, what about you? Any, any projects that got away? Uh, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of projects that I do want to get to at some point, but I don't think they've gotten away fully yet. And so I don't really like to talk about them because it feels like letting something out, ha out half cooked and it's like, I, I don't want to. You don't want to let it go because you yeah, might yeah. actually do it. And honestly, one of the um, things that almost became one of those was the computer reset video because I, at the time, it seemed like one of those once in a lifetime, this is going to go away, the place is going to be bulldozed or something. And then it turned out it wasn't, so it's fine. But yeah, that was one of those dream projects. I always wanted to find an old computer warehouse and go in there and see what it was like. And you know, I literally had dreams about that kind of thing for years. So I thankfully did get to make that, but it was like, it felt like it was this close to becoming one of those that got away. But Thankfully, it didn't at the moment. That's Actually, okay. yeah, that that's, uh, kind of brings up uh, an idea I was thinking about. Um, I wanted to do a video about First Tech and Team Electronics, which had the first Apple reseller store in the world. It was in Minneapolis on Hennepin Avenue. And I wanted to do a video about it, maybe go to the store and interview some guys, but uh, it's now an orange therapy gym. It's all gone. Uh, so, yeah, the timing didn't work out so well for that one, but yeah, it happens. That's fair. Uh, right, right before we turn it over, I see a hand. Um, is there anything you guys would like to ask each other? <laughs> Probably not, considering that you're sitting not only at the same table outside, shameless plug, but uh, um, in the exact order that you well, sit Well, I, I don't have Ken, but I, I actually have Clint on my speed dial on my phone, so I can <laughs> you talk to him anytime I want. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I got a question for you guys. What is it like sitting like two to six feet that way? Um, it's a little harder on the it's a little harder on the neck because I have to look at Jim. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a sign for me to be quiet. Oh, uh, let's, uh, so let's see. Yeah, let's. Anyone who wants to raise a question, we've got two mics, uh, but unfortunately, only one uh, Michael to hand them out. So uh, just be patient, and eventually we'll get to you. Okay, how do I explain this? I have so many questions. Uh, I'll have to pick one. Uh, has there ever been like a you like a videos or a few or like uh, like a couple of videos where you do it and you look back and like, 
why do I, when I make the video, it's like, it like feels really cringe. Like, like you don't like the video you did anymore. Or, or it got, someone got a hold of it and it sort of became a bit of a meme, like the 8-bit guy with his guns. I can answer that. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. And if you ask, if you, there's someone in particular you want to answer your question, uh, yeah. try to direct it to them. Uh, Clint, yeah, why don't you go for that? Oh, yeah. Uh, in terms of videos that kind of come across as cringy, looking back on them, that would be everything, like, made before, like, tw a couple years ago, it feels like. I really don't like looking at any of those. And almost every single one of them I would redo if I felt that I should or could or whatever. Uh, and then, yeah, occasionally I still see myself showing up as a random gif of just an animated thing making a weird face. Like, I, it's like become a reaction thing, and then on, on yeah, and occasionally somebody will link me to a weird Tumblr thread from years ago, and it's still going, and it's just the same face over and over <laughs> without any context. I still don't know when that happened, but it did, and it's uh, bizarre. <laughs> Anyone else want to tackle that at all? No, uh, just in general, like I don't typically personally like any video I made more than a few months ago, but honestly it just means you're learning, just means you're getting better. But, uh, and then some people will link me to a video like on Twitter and they'll say, oh hey, I love this video of yours and it's one I made 10 years ago and I'm like, oh my gosh. But then I'll find myself watching other channels' old videos and I'm like, oh, I get it. As a viewer, I don't care how old it is, but as the creator, yeah. yeah. <laughs> David, so what about I, you? I, I cringe a little bit when I look at some of my videos from like five or six years ago, or maybe even not that long, maybe four or five years ago, because the video quality wasn't as good, the audio quality wasn't as good, and even my dictation, uh, I think, was a little more like, um, like, like reading, like... Stilted? Like dry? Yeah, like I'm reading from a script, which I do read from a script, but I've learned to read from a script uh, and be a little bit more natural. You know, and so yeah, I feel like I was a little bit more robotic back in, in the previous videos. And so yeah, just, just from the quality standpoint and whatnot, I mean, I, I think a lot of the topics I did back then were really good, but I, I, I do cringe sometimes looking at my own performances and stuff, so yeah. Any more questions? Raise hands. Um, I have to choose, crap. Um, I guess the one I'll ask, mainly directed to Clint, but I guess everybody can ask this. Are you more likely to uh, just lose interest in a thing? And uh, Sorry, let's say you, you make a video and you don't do a follow-up on the thing. Uh, like I'm thinking in particular, I think it was the, the PC-98 stuff that you were working on, and you were super jazzed about that at the time, and then there was never really any follow-up. Uh, does that kind of situation, is it more likely that like you just lose interest and move on to the next thing and it never happens, or... Is it that, like, will you finish stuff, get into it, but then just never make a video about it? Like, what tends to be the situation? Yeah, that was a thing where I had never had a Japanese computer before that was exclusive to that, uh, the NEC PC-98. So, yeah, or, yeah, whatever it was, 88. And uh, so when I got it, I was super jazzed to do it. And then the farther I got into research... And looking into it, I'm like, well, you know, I really need that peripheral, and then I need the tape drive, and maybe like a disc or something. And then, oh, well, I found this one seller with a monitor that fit it perfectly, and I'm like, sure, I'll go ahead and do that. And then it never showed up. So, yeah, little things like that end up piling up more often than not. I'm still really interested in doing it, but I would love to at least have a few more representative examples of what it was like to actually use it before dedicating a video to it, and then feeling like it's half of the story. So, yeah. Uh, just asking this in general, it doesn't matter if it's YouTube or production or anything like that. What has been the biggest thing that's grinded your gears when you've made videos? YouTube commenters. <laughs> but not you guys. Not you guys, no. For, for, for real though, for real. 99% uh, of the comments I get are really awesome and you guys are really great. Um, but the problem is it's the 1% of the bad ones I remember. So I have to be careful with how much I read. But uh, hey, that's just me. I'd like to hear everybody answer that one. <laughs> I didn't fully hear the question. What, uh, what, if, what is it about making YouTube that grinds your gears? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I hope I didn't just alienate my whole audience. Sorry, sorry everybody. <laughs> yeah, for me, the problem is everybody wants perfection. Yep. So, um, you know, 
I just have some talking to somebody earlier about color balance. You know, it's like I'll somebody will like I'll get like a hundred emails complaining that I look too green or something in a video or something like that. And like I don't have anything else to worry about because I've already got to script all this and film all this and narrate all this and edit all this and come up with the content, all this kind of stuff. And plus, I got to be my own cameraman and all this kind of stuff. And they're complaining this. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll next time I'll color balance it a little bit more. Um, to the other direction. And then I get a hundred comments saying, well, now you're too red or whatever. And I'm like, you just can't, you can't please everyone. And then there's everybody always complaining about things like, you get emails like, David, why don't you ever, like ever cut out that CRT whine noise in your videos? And I'm like, I go through every video and I look and I look and I look and I, cause I can't hear it. I'm too old and I can't hear the noise. So I'll look at the, um, you know, you can see the audio and I'll look for any video clip where there's a CRT. And if I see it, I'll grab this little filter and dump on there or whatever. And so I might filter out like 50 clips cause my average video has like 200 some odd clips in it. Right. And so I'll filter out like 50 clips that have CRTs in them. But if I miss like two seconds somewhere of a CRT wine, I'll get like a hundred emails. Why don't you ever, ever <laughs> yep. cut out that noise? Is it too much? You know what? <laughs> yep. So that's kind of stuff. Yeah, it can get pretty irritating. Yeah, and, and, and on that note, like sometimes we all probably have, we'll receive like real constructive feedback and I have adjusted my videos. I've learned how to color balance better from real good constructive feedback as long as it's not too trolly where I just put it in the spam filter. But yeah, you just, you have to really balance how much time you spend in the comments because it, it can wear you down. <laughs> but you can learn from it. You can. Yeah, uh, I'll go with a slightly different direction of something that's sort of a curse and a blessing at the same time. It's no matter how obscure a topic or something, some item is that I find and want to cover, there's always going to be a couple of people that are absolute experts on this thing. And so you can put all the time you want into it over months sometimes. And then you put it out there and like say there's a fact or some series of software or something and you can't find any information on this anywhere at all. And as soon as you post a video, two seconds, there's the guy with the novel. And then like <laughs> yep, all of the information is there and it feels like it makes my video kind of obsolete because here's all the information that I said in the video I couldn't find. Yeah. And you know, it's like the tiny little thing where it's a, bl a, a blessing and a curse because like, hey, good, the information's out there now. At the same time, uh, I feel bad because I couldn't have found it. Or you know, where was this guy like five minutes ago or five days ago or five weeks ago? And so it's, it's cool that there's so many people that are knowledgeable in the community. They always come through with that. Yeah. Uh, but it's at the same time, it's like, dang it, that could have made the video better. <laughs> they oh, always come knew. out of the woodworks when the video's done. Yeah. And I'll go like on forums like asking, hey, does anybody know this? Does anybody know this? Yes. Does anybody know yes. this? And what's worse, of course, is when you release the video and someone's like, hey, moron, what do you know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I looked and looked and looked. Where were you? With those? Why weren't you in that forum? You know, you could have answered this. Or like covering games. Like no matter how bad the game is, it's always like somebody's favorite. So I try to not completely destroy things in terms of, uh, you know, like just trashing a game if, if whenever I do cover them still. And it's like, you know, this is somebody's favorite. Even if I think it's terrible, I at least try to find something about it that's like fascinating or was interesting for the time. Or you could tell the developers were trying, you know, give, you give people the benefit of it. Do what? Is that what you did with Planet X3? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you were really trying hard, but you know. <laughs> Maybe someday you'll remake that purple Saturn Day video. Yes. You didn't give it a fair shake. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> More questions? I'm sure we, there we go. Yes? So of all the pieces of vintage tech you've collected through the years, what would you say has the most interesting background story for how it came into your possession? Yeah. Hmm. All right. I can answer that. Yeah, right buy us some time. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I've had a lot of really cool and interesting pieces donated, but that's not a very interesting story. That just arrives. But I'll tell you one. This actually happened when I was 16 years old, and y'all have seen um, my videos with uh, Vic20. Actually, I have two of them, but the one I usually show in the videos is like pristine. And um, I had a Vic20 when I was a kid, but um, I think we traded it to, or sold it to somebody or something when we upgraded to a C64. Well, when I was 16 years old, I was working at a, as a bag boy at a Winn-Dixie grocery store, and I didn't have much interest in vintage computers back then because they weren't really all that vintage yet. 
because this would have been in like 1989 or 90 or something like that. Anyway, but I was hauling some stuff out to this lady's, uh, old lady's car to put, you know, the, her bags in there. I guess, do they even do that anymore? I don't think that's a thing anymore. Um, but, but anyway, she opens her trunk and there's this VIC-20 sitting in there in the box. And um, I asked her, I'm like, oh, what are you, what are you doing with this Commodore VIC-20? And she says, oh, well, we've had this for a while in our family. Nobody's ever used it. I was taking it to the dump later to throw it out. And I said, oh, well, my car's right here. Can I just have it? <laughs> and she's like, okay, here you go. And I still have that VIC-20 today, and I've shown it in a number of my videos. And I got that out of an old lady's trunk when I was working as a bag boy at Winn-Dixie. So the, I hope that's interesting enough. <laughs> a lot of people here are fans of rescuing vintage tech, so good on you. Um, I'm putting the two of you on the spot, Ken and Clint. Any Stories about uh, <laughs> finding things in strange, odd, or maybe even illegal ways. <laughs> well, that's a different story. <laughs> I'm sure that the statute of okay. limitations has expired, I, I assure you. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, yeah, one of my first vintage computers that I got when I first was getting back into them, or it wasn't even that. I wasn't even collecting yet. I just wanted an old 486 to mess with. And, uh, yeah, back in high school that we had... A computer lab full of all of these old compact machines and computers made by various companies. But there was this one, the Compact Presario 425, all-in-one thing, and they were going to be discontinuing the use of them. And this is like in the early 2000s. And so, yeah, it was just hanging around there. And, uh, yeah, they had somebody with us chaperoning the, the, the guys that were in the computer class. We had to discard them. They all had to go somewhere some sort of dumpster crusher thing but not a single one of them went into that thing we all took them out behind the school where the truck was that was going to take them off to recycling and we just left them there and literally on lunch break there was a couple of us that went out to go and just take them all and we're like hey does anybody have a car that could fit these and somebody came up he had an old dodge challenger we just loaded them in the back of his car he was like yeah i got you boy i'm gonna stick them and it was great and i still have that machine that's the compact presario the all-in-one that i use uh, that i use still on my channel and there was literally a rescue that was supposed to be discarded because it was had school property it still has the property sticker on the side uh but hey i mean you know it was literally being tossed out and i was 17 so who cares <laughs> What about you, Ken? So the one that comes to mind is actually the story of how I discovered this computer festival in the first place. I, I really wanted a Macintosh TV because like all the classic Macs were beige, but the Mac TV was black and I just like black. So I, I never could find one for a good price that I wanted. So I thought, well, I'll go on Craigslist. I've never used Craigslist before. You know, I heard some stories and, you know, horror stories, but a lot of that doesn't really happen in reality. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to Craigslist search Macintosh TV in the area, and boom, there's one in uh, Highland Park, I think is the neighborhood, and uh, Brian from MacNition, he had it for sale. And I went to his place, and I bought it from his store, and he donated some other cool things to my YouTube channel, and then we got talking about this computer festival that's in Elmhurst. And I'm like, whoa, what's that? And then, well, now I'm here. So it all started from a Craigslist search, and now I'm at this table. Look at that. Thank you, Craigslist. Craig, wherever you are, you have a good list. <laughs> uh, I know I'm not part of the panel, but I actually have a story that you might be interested in. I, uh, in 1997, uh, I decided to start collecting sound cards, and on Usenet, on a for sale, uh, I posted, yes, this is how far back this is. Uh, I posted that I was looking for an IBM music feature card, and I got in touch with a Boken Raton former IBM employee who said, yeah, and it's in the machine, and I don't really want to go through the trouble, so I'll just send you the whole thing. So I got the card inside an XT286, a very rare variant of the IBM PCXT. So uh, that's my strange acquisition story. So, we have more questions? Um, do you ha do you, okay, so this is to the whole panel, but uh, do you have any projects that you uh, r either regret attempting or regret, you know, not doing because you thought, you know, for some reason or the other that you were limited by, you know, uh, funds or really anything? I know that's really two questions, but, you know. 
So that was a little hard to hear, but I think what you were asking was, uh, does the panel have any projects they either regret doing or regret not doing? Is that about right? Okay. Uh, any projects you regret doing or regret not doing? Not doing. Are I regret not starting order? YouTube earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Are we going in a particular order here? No, uh, no, no. It was okay, to the yeah, whole I'll panel. So whoever has a. They, they whoever must be having a hard time thinking of something. I can only think of like 50 things already. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the one I regret the most is that, that IBM Workstation video. And I, I you know, I, of course I did a whole response to that, so I mean, it's no secret that uh, I was really surprised by the outrage that I received over that video. It, it took me totally by surprise, but um, in retrospect, I think what I didn't recognize is that um, I didn't place any value on that computer as a, uh, a collectible or something. Yeah, something that other than just just a computer, and neither did any of the guys involved in getting it to me, or any of the guys I talked to, or basically anybody I knew in person that had, because a dozen people had already come over and seen it or whatever, and none of us really thought it was anything other than just a curiosity. And it, I guess, there were people out there that I guess are really like. I guess it would be like me watching some guy taking a Vic twenty and hitting it with a sledgehammer or something. You know, I would be really outraged, you know, and I guess there were people out there that felt that way about that machine and just none of us that were expected that there were, that there were anybody. Yeah, when you, you broadcast know. to an audience of over a million, uh, <laughs> it's the woodwork principle. They come yeah. out of it and, uh, yeah. 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 You know, in your defense, uh, this is, the, 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 the shorting was actually something you did uh, somewhat common when you were at oh, AST, yeah. is that right? Oh, so, so it wasn't completely out of the blue. No, I even in my IT jobs, my I worked at a computer shop for like five years. That was a common procedure yeah. to do, yeah. but it always worked before. It's <laughs> well, so always the first time. Uh, Ken, Clint, any of you guys have projects you uh, regret doing or regret not doing? I, and maybe not individual projects, but I do regret not doing certain types of content sooner because I think if I had been building up my abilities in making certain types of uh, higher quality, better researched, you know, longer, more in-depth stuff, uh, then maybe I would be even better at it by now. But you know, because for so long, it was really just an off the cuff doing stuff for fun, not putting a whole lot into it. But I discovered that, hey, I do like spending hours and hours and hours down a research rabbit hole and trying to uncover something that hasn't been said or hasn't been documented or preserved or something. And, and that whole scene just really uh, invigorated things again when it was getting kind of stale, it was getting kind of burnt out, you know, six years ago or something, five years ago. And uh, yeah, just sort of rediscovering, <laughs> putting more work into my work, I guess. And then, yeah, I, I really wish I had done that even sooner because it made the content a heck of a lot better, I think, and uh, led to more personal fulfillment yeah, I don't have anything crazy or like a specific project or anything, but, but around you're crazy Ken. Yeah, cra oh yeah. Oh man, I'm not living up to my own name. I apologize to my shareholders. <laughs> but when I was about to go off to college, I was like, well, I might have to live in a dorm, and I have this massive collection of computers. I don't know where I'm going to put all these things. And um, what I did was I put out like some Twitter things and was like, hey, if anybody wants these, I'm just giving them away. Just give them to a good home. I asked around for about a week and I got n no nibbles. So unfortunately, I ended up bringing everything to an e-waste place. And th like the day after, I got two responses, and I was like, "Darn it!" So uh, I do miss those things. I look. I took a photo of the stock pile before I recycled it, and I look back at it now, and I'm like, "Oh, that's kind of rare. That's kind of rare. Oh, why did I get rid of all this stuff? I had no idea what I had. So I kind of regret recycling all those things like 12 years ago or uh, 10 years ago. Yeah." You're not alone. I think every hobbyist has some story where they're like, I have no idea why I threw that out. And it just, I think everyone's done that. I uh, see we have more questions. Raise of hands. So for, for any video topic you choose to I'm do... I'm sorry, I, uh, could you lower your mask to ask the question? It's, it's muffled. That's okay. So for any topic that you do a video on, uh, you know there's going to be some people who are interested but barely know anything. There'll be some people who are interested who know a lot and everywhere in between. How do you sort of gauge how much detail to put in the video about whatever you're talking about to not, you know, bore too many people with extra details or vice versa, you know? 
So the question, uh, for anyone who didn't hear it, uh, how do you determine how much detail to put into your videos? Too much would bore people, too little wouldn't be interesting enough? How do you address that? Well, that's always a fine line that you have, like a tightrope that you have to walk, because if you put too little detail, your video is maybe not very good. If you put too much, then like I said, it's too boring. My way of dealing with that is, of course, I write out the script, I put as much information as I think you need to know, but then as I'm in the process of making and editing this video, a lot of you may not know, but I mean, I have to watch the video like 300 times as I'm editing it, and if at any point, I've after I've watched it five or six times, I'm like, and this part here is freaking boring. I just, I just take it out, you know? And, and so I think that if I'm able to endure watching it 300 times with, and, and, and like all of it, I'm pretty sure the audience will too. So you and use it. yourself as the audience, essentially. Yeah. 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 yeah, a little trick I picked up from um, another editor who works on a big vlog YouTube channel was like, if you make your first edit of the video, it's usually gonna be longer than the final cut. So let's say you have it in a rough cut stage, and you're watching it by yourself, if at any moment you're watching it and you feel like you need a distraction, like, oh, I'm gonna reach for my phone or whatever, that's a sign that you're getting bored of your own video. Just cut that part out. And that's, that's a little tip I picked up on. And my audience retention has gone up a lot since I've started studying how to edit for retention. Um, like an industry target for YouTube retention is 33%, which means on average, people are watching at least a third of your video. But when I started studying that stuff more, I got my retention up to about 58 or 60%, yeah. Yeah, if you edit for retention, you get a higher percentage, more people watch. That YouTube loves minutes. The more minutes a person watches of your channel, the more the algorithm. Not that I'm saying you should serve the algorithm. It's, you know, just a robot. But uh, it, it'll help get your stuff recommended to that viewer more, and you'll yeah. get more views, and your channel will grow. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just kind of really echoing a lot of that. If you find yourself feeling for anything else, and you're just not completely into that, uh, honestly, sometimes I'll just have a shot of whiskey. And if I can't pay attention... <laughs> I'll re-edit the video, like it, uh, take notes, like seriously, you know, just <laughs> sit back, get nice and relaxed, and if the video is not holding my own attention, that's just, that's just a bad sign, re-edit, 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 many, many dozens of times. Each video probably goes through at least a dozen edits, for me anyway, at renders, you know, so just. Mm. <laughs> I think we had someone in the yeah, front here. question, yeah, from someone here in the front. Uh, what do you like in now? about doing YouTube. I'm sorry, can you say that again? What do you like and not like about doing YouTube? What do you like and not like about doing YouTube? How long do we have? Yeah. There's a <laughs> I mean, per personally, I like the fact that I've been able to make a living off of it. It gives you a certain amount of freedom, but on the flip side, you're your own boss now, so you gotta get your ass out of bed and do the job. No one's there to tell you how to do it, so you really have to learn how to discipline yourself. But. Uh, I think it's worked out, but it is not for everybody. It is, uh, it is hard. I agree. It's, it's very hard work. A lot of people are surprised when I tell them how many hours I work. And, of course, YouTube is my job, but I also do game development and all this other kinds of stuff that kind of goes into that. But I work like 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week. And, and maybe I'll only end up making one video out of all of that. And uh, I think there's this, um, you know, I, I went to my daughter's school one time for career day several years ago. I, I think she was in eighth or ninth grade, something like that. And um, I didn't even think they'd want a YouTuber there, but they asked me to come. So I'm like, okay. So, you know, I talked to the, all the students about my job, you know, after we listened to the firemen and the policemen and all those people. <laughs> and the one thing I noticed right away listening to some of those young teens is they had this impression that YouTube is like, first of all, you work five minutes a week, you're a millionaire, and you know, you got your own private jet, and you know, people are following you around, you know, like uh, worshiping you or whatever, and I'm like, no, it's, it's nothing, like everything you just said, to quote Luke Skywalker, everything in that sentence was wrong. <laughs> you know, it is, it's a lot of work, it often goes very underappreciated, and we have to deal with tons and tons of hate mail, death threats, everything you can imagine. Uh, and it's even way worse for a female YouTuber, as I've talked to several of them, because they get sexual harassment and all kinds of things. And so um, it's, um, I'm not saying it's bad. Like Ken said, there's some great things about it. I do get to set my own schedule, um, you know, and things like that. But I do also work myself way too hard sometimes. 
Uh, yeah, for me, it's just being able to uh, balance work and, and life in that respect because I'm working at home primarily. Uh, you know, I did get a place to uh, just rent it out, store some stuff and film there too. And I try to do that as much as I can, but it's really, really hard for me to turn my brain off at the end of the day because there is no end of the day exactly. So there's that. I don't really like that part. But the other part on the, uh, the opposite side of that spectrum is uh, just the community that's come up around it. I completely never expected to have such a strong community of supporters. You know, my ride or dies, as I like to call them, like they're always going to be there or in some form uh, <laughs> ready to support something. And then when I do screw up, they're cool enough about it to like send a really nice, thoughtful, well-worded things being like, you know what, this, 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 and this. And that's great. Like that helps so much. And I don't know even if I would still be doing YouTube if it weren't for the unexpected people coming out of every corner of the internet, it seems to encourage me to do it. Even when like when something goes wrong or something is a little weird in a video, they're almost more encouraging. Yeah, the right people anyway. So that's I think the best part of it is having yeah, just folks on your side at all. Absolutely. Because like, I feel like I didn't have that growing up. And now I do. Yeah. So. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a holy grail piece of tech that you've been un unable to acquire that you want to do a video on? Oh, man. Yeah. All kinds of things. Clint, you got something? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one to narrow down, to be honest. I do have a holy grail list on, I keep on Google Docs. And anytime somebody sends an email asking, like, is there one thing that you could, yeah, just send them the list. So I could send you the list. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it's usually, like, just a very one-off kind of um, well, not even one-off, just things that you're only going to see one or two of in your life or something that has somehow become so expensive that I know I'm never, ever going to be able to get it myself. Like the AdLib Gold, for instance, that Jim hooked me up with. So thanks to Jim for that video coming together. Because otherwise, I really, you know, when something starts getting out of control in the, the secondary market, it becomes this unobtainable thing. And I just wanted to see it documented in some way online. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's usually just individual items, sound cards and video cards mainly. Yeah. Any, any, any yeah, holy grail stuff for you guys? I don't, I don't think there's anything at this point. I, You've seen it all. <laughs> well, well, you um, have a mindset and a Hyperion. I think you may have actually seen it all. I, I've, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go into, you know, 20 minute the thing, but uh, bottom line is, you know, I, I, I ran into a bit of a problem a few years ago where uh, uh, just the donations were coming in like crazy. It was really cool at first. And then, you know, next thing you know, my house, like you're having to, like you can't even get from one room to the other without like stepping over things. And, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to put this stuff. And uh, so long story short, um, I had to start getting rid of stuff. And, uh, and, and now I work on a little bit different because before I was always like, I cannot turn that donation down because I might need that for video someday. But we've got this in Dallas. Now we have this really good community of like a couple hundred people now collectors that we all kind of work together. And the great thing is no matter what it is out there, I know somebody who owns one. So when I'm ready to do the video, all I need to do is call up somebody and say, hey, can I borrow your XYZ, whatever it is. And so personally, I am done like owning like, I mean, a million computers. I've actually been in the very a process over the last two years of trying to make a video about something and then I'm donating it away or giving it away or whatever to clear, clear out. So I don't think there's anything anybody could offer me at this point that I would take to like put in my house, like, you know. Yeah, that's sort of the thing, too. I found that, like, it was like the ad lib again. Being able to borrow that was kind of a blessing because it's so valuable. I don't know what I would do with it, and I wouldn't even want to ever use it or anything. So just being able to have temporary access to something, and, uh, yeah, that <laughs> that's a lot better. Same thing, too, with donations. It was cool as it was at first. Yeah, I have to give away almost as many things as come in now, which, you know, that's cool, too. I can pass it along, but, yeah, I'd much rather just have something on loan if somebody trusts me with it, so... I mean, I'm not getting rid of the Apple One, um, but that I made 
But as an example, like even like that VIC-20 that I built recently out of all of the shelf parts, which, oh, by the way, that guy is here. Uh, he has a booth out there. I don't know if he's in here in this room or not. But but uh, anyway, like that was a cool project and everything. But as soon as I was done with that, I offered it up on my local group. Somebody came right over just like that, picked it up and said, here you go, have it. So, I mean, it's not that I don't think it's cool. I just don't have the room to, to keep that stuff. So. <laughs> I still have time for more questions, and we still have more people raising hands. This one's for Ken. I was yes, Ken here. <laughs> I was wondering, how did you come up for the persona for your uh, channel? How did that come about? So, I do not, not actually crazy, are you, Ken? <laughs> I retract my question immediately. Maybe. So back in the earlier days of Crazy Ken, I never showed my face on camera. I don't know if anyone ever watches Ashens, but like it was kind of like that where it's like just his hands and a couch, right? You like really don't see his face. So that's the kind of style I was going for. So I was like, oh, no one sees my face. I can kind of make this cool avatar that has like a TV head and like all this stuff. So that's kind of where that started from. In fact, the first photo of that was actually me holding a TV in front of my face. But then I changed it and I actually had a professional artist like actually draw something like that. So now that's kind of like my mascot or my alter ego, but that's where it came from. And um, you know, the face where it looks like uh, the X's and like the frowny face that comes from the sad Mac. You know, when your Mac would crash, it would show the dead eyes and stuff like that. It totally came from that. So Susan Kerr, I stole your idea. So uh, your graphics, I, I, borrow I borrowed your idea. So that's where that came from. Uh, more questions? Greetings, gentlemen. Greetings. Hello. Yes. How are you, gentlemen? All I am good. Big. Good. Uh, now, regarding, uh, sorry, regarding tech, how old is too old for, for topics on your channel? How new is too new for software or for hardware? So that question was, how, how old is too old for you guys to cover it? And how new is too new for you guys to cover it? Hmm. That's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, on my channel, I, I do like to balance it with some new stuff every so often because there's always going to be that exception of like, okay, there's this really cool new thing I do want to show, even though I generally lean towards more retro and prototypey, obscure type stuff. So yeah, I don't think there's a solid number. It's just kind of whether or not I give a crap about it. <laughs> I think I think for me, obviously, there's nothing too old, but I mean, let's face it, the computer industry hasn't been around exactly all that long. So I mean, you're not going to find much before like the 1960s. So, but I mean, if I had something cool to show or, and it'd be hard for me to show something from the sixties or even some of the early seventies computers simply because I don't understand them and I don't know, I'm not qualified really to do videos on them. But if I, if I get something and I think I can do one, I will, uh, as far as newer stuff, I mean, I've done stuff on things from the mid two thousands before, as long as I think it's a product that is not made anymore, had some cool niche to it at the time and is now considered a little bit obsolete, I'll, I will do it. But I mean, I'm, not, I'm obviously not gonna make a video on the latest like MacBook Air or something like that. I mean, that's just not my, my thing. Well, that, that's what I did. You took a direct stab at me. <laughs> <laughs> I was just stoked that it had a freaking. Uh, it was so cool to do a video on the MacBook Air. Like I don't do a lot of new stuff anymore, but when that MacBook Air came out, I was like, ooh, I wanna play with that. And then return it right back to Apple because I didn't wanna keep it. <laughs> Just keep it for the camera and then mm, <laughs> ship it back. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have much of a response to that either, unfortunately, because I, I don't think anything is too old necessarily or too new. It just has to be interesting enough uh, as long as it has some sort of intrigue to it, you know, an oddity, uh, a, you know, there's a lot of modern things that come out and I look at them, I'm like, that's future oddware right there. It could be <laughs> oddware right now. It's just not obsolete yet. So, you know, it's, I, I typically don't cover things when they're brand, brand new, but occasionally, yeah, something will just be so interesting that I can't not talk about it. So I used to think your cutoff was anything with vacuum tubes. And then I think you reviewed an amplifier that had a vacuum yeah, tube in yeah, it. Yeah. Vacuum tubes are cool. <laughs> All right, this is mainly towards David, but I guess it go go to uh, Ken or Clint too. Has there been like a piece of hardware that you've restored or really worked on really hard? And at the end of the day, after using it for a while, you just look down and go, "This thing sucks." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can think of a few. Um, Probably the first one I'm going to throw out there is the Tommy or Tommy Tudor. Um, 
there's oh and then i did this other one gosh i can't remember what it was called it was another little like educational computer i did a few years ago can't remember what it's called yeah <laughs> those are the only ones that come to mind right now but but i, I could probably think of some others yeah I would say recently the uh, the Cybico, the little handheld radio thing, little kids toy, which I mean the idea was great, and it had to <laughs> get new batteries and restore the motherboard traces and things like that, and it was awful. And you got about like six feet of range with the radio, so yeah, that was terrible. But at least I think the video was fun. Yeah, I don't do a ton of restoring stuff just because uh, I bring in smarter people than me to help me with that sort of thing. But uh, there was one project I was going to attempt. It was uh, not really a really vintage computer. It was a Power Mac G5, you know, the first uh, cheese grater that Apple made. And I thought, oh, well, I got this as a donation. We'll see if we can get it working, have some fun with it. And for those who saw the episode, you know where I'm going with this. I didn't know it was a liquid-cooled G5. I didn't know it was leaking into the power supply when I went to go plug it in, and then just boom, the thing freaking exploded. So that was all on camera. That was really fun. Not touching that thing again. <laughs> what would you consider to be your, like, your crown jewel of your collections? If you had to pare everything down to just like one item, what would be your favorite or most, the coolest thing you own? Coolest thing in your collection, your crown jewel. I'm thinking. He's the <laughs> I'll, I'll, buy, I'll buy him some time. Uh, I would say um, I probably got a couple. I mean, that's why I brought him to the booth here. Like, uh, the 20th anniversary Macintosh is crazy cool. Like, that thing Apple only made once. It was like a $7,500 computer. A dude drove to your house in a limo and, like, set it up in your house for you. It was a really special computer. When Steve Jobs got back to the company, he was like, uh-uh, we're not doing that anymore. So there's not many of them around. So I would say that's a crown jewel. And the next cube, a big freaking black cube, that thing's really cool. Uh, I have those here at my booth, shameless plug. Um, and I picked them up here two years ago at Vintage Computer Festival in Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm going to go with my Commodore Max as probably my, and that was donated to me because it's super rare Japanese Commodore machine. Um, it prob that's probably my crown jewel. I'd say mine is just the, the collection of registered shareware games I have for DOS. <laughs> like, because nobody had that. Everybody just played the free ones, you know? But I got a registered episode of Duke Nukem, and it's great. <laughs> like, the whole thing. All three episodes on a disc, and you had to mail order that sucker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this one's for LGR. Uh, so uh, kind of going back to your old videos, um, whatever happened to the uh, the comfy couch? I know it wasn't quite the Ashens uh, couch, uh, comfy chair, sorry. And uh, also, uh, are you ever going to do another video with uh, uh, roses again? I mean, yeah, if, if, if a thing ever came up, I'm, I'm always down for something but i know our two channels have kind of gone in very different directions so yeah I'm, i don't know I, I guess yeah it would just depend on opportunity as for the the comfy chair which is really gross <laughs> uh i do still have it it's in the guest bedroom at my house <laughs> and anytime somebody goes in there they're like that thing is nasty but i recognize it from the video so i'll accept it so yeah it's it's still around it was a goodwill find from like 15 years ago and, uh, yep, it's, it exists. I, I, I almost brought it, honestly. <laughs> I'd have to rent a truck and, like, put a hazmat suit on it. Uh, yep. Question in the back. Okay, so this is kind of a general question, but what's your favorite piece of tech that you have that's not rare or vintage or anything, but it's just weird, and it's just kind of something that you're like, I don't know why I have this, but I do, and it's cool. I, it was a little hard to hear your question. Your favorite piece of, what was it, tech craft or tech technology? Your favorite piece of tech that you have that's like, it's not rare or vintage, but it's cool and I don't know why I have it. Your favorite piece of tech that may not be vintage, but it's cool and you like having it. My, 
while they're thinking, uh, I'm a fan of odd phones. I have a Sony Xperia 2, <laughs> and it shoots uh, HLG 10-bit HDR, and of course I've never used that function. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I don't know, because like yeah. everything I have is old. Uh, yeah. Same here. Everything I, even like my daily driver laptop is like eight years old. I mean, I, I it's a good question. I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> Follow my Twitter. I'll post an answer in ten seconds after this panel. I'll be like, oh, now I know what I want to say. <laughs> David, your EVs um, maybe? I'm I'm really struggling with that one. Well, you uh, had a Tesla at one point. And, uh, I, actually, I was about to say my Fiat 500e might be, because it's not my daily driver. My, my daily driver is actually parked out here, but I have this Fiat 500e. It's a little electric version of the Fiat. They only made like 5,000 of them, but they're super fast. Like, they'll do like circles around regular Fiats, and I paid like almost nothing from it from this guy. <laughs> and and uh, I still have it. I've had that for years. It just sits next to my house. I drive it like once a month. Um, it's a cool did, little piece of technology, but I have no real good reason for owning it at this point. I did definitely thought of a thing. I forgot about my modular synthesizer. I don't need that at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there, and like, yeah, 90% of the modules, is they're just there because they look cool. I, <laughs> yeah, this one's mostly for Dave. Uh, with your new space... Uh, what are you most excited about having that? You know, what what are the limitations that you know you've talked about a little bit in your videos about you know some of the issues you've had with what you originally were doing? I'm, I'm what, having two, a two, little bit of trouble. Was this you. was this directed at David? What, yeah. So he's asking uh, about your new space. About I heard yeah. that part, and I didn't hear the second half. That it is mostly just clarifying that. Um, you know, really, I you know, just wanted to know what are you most excited about having that new space? What are you able to do that you weren't able to do before? Well, I just have more room to work. Um, I, uh, it's funny because people that came over before, I've had a lot of visitors, they would always walk into my studio. Number one thing, in fact, sometimes I would just wait for them to say it. They'd be like, oh my God, it's, it looks so much bigger on YouTube because people were always really surprised how little space I had to work with. And it's funny because people don't say that anymore when they come over to the new studio. But what I always tell them is like, this studio here, this is the size everybody thought my old one was. <laughs> it's actually much bigger. I have room to work. And, uh, and, and uh, I actually have room to work on more than one project now too because I, I have the two different rooms. And uh, it, it's also nice because it's outside of the house. So if my daughter's got friends over making noise or the dog's barking or my wife's watching TV or whatever, none of that interferes anymore with my ability to shoot video because I used to have to wait for very specific times to shoot video. Um, even if I was ready, like I'd have everything set up, the camera ready, I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to have to wait for whatever noise it is to stop because, you know, um, including my lovely neighbor who had this... Uh, Camaro who removed his muffler with a straight pipe and he used to just let that thing sit in front of his house sometimes for 30 or 40 minutes just <laughs> and you know I can't film with that thankfully that is would still be a problem even in the new studio but thankfully he sold that car but anyway but yeah I less less time waiting to get something filmed I can film pretty much as soon as I'm ready now because it's a separate building that's a, probably the biggest advantage so, yeah <laughs> More questions? Hey, Mike, we actually had someone down in front, too, as well. So this gentleman here. What is the favorite meme you've seen of, you've seen of yourselves or other tech YouTubers? Well, if you attended David's uh, presentation earlier today, you may have seen one. Someone made a demo uh, dedicated to David. Uh, yeah, I'd say with, in, in, in my case, uh, the, all the memes that came from the Ninja Nanny piece of software, it was awful, and it was a terrible program, and I just did it as a filler video, but it was one of those that somehow exploded on certain bizarre subsets, I think in Japanese or something. 
And all of a sudden it just started getting random translated text beneath it and I still get occasionally sent those and there'll be a burst of views on that video every so often. It's, it's not even a popular video. I don't know what happened, but that's kind of what's amusing about the memes. They just exist because they do. I'm actually not really familiar with any memes. Maybe I just have, haven't seen them. I mean, there's those YouTube poop videos out there with me and Techmoan <laughs> that are pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know if that counts is what you're asking for, but uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with any memes. I guess Ken's struggling to... Yeah, I can't, I can't think, I, like, no, nothing satisfactory right now. <laughs> We still have about 10 minutes for questions, so if you guys have questions, now's the time to ask. So uh, all of you have a pretty unique career. Something that I'm very curious about is, let's say you go to the dentist and the dentist comes by and says, so what do you do for a living? What do you say? Yeah, right? Is this like, while the stuff is in your mouth or not? <laughs> I usually just say I'm a video producer on YouTube and usually that goes into a conversation about, you know, the, the dentist or the dental assistant will say, oh yeah, yeah, my kid wants to be on YouTube and all that stuff and then we talk about that and, and then it resumes to mirrors and hooks being shoved in my mouth. Um, yeah, I don't know about the dentist or anything, but like if I'm in an Uber or something like that and somebody, you know, is asking me what I do for a living. I usually avoid the whole YouTube thing. I just say, oh, I work in video production. That usually kind of ends it because I really don't like, if they don't already know who I am, I don't really want to spend the next 20 minutes explaining what it's like to be a YouTuber. It gets old. So, you know, that's, that's how I am. That's a good point. I actually do the same thing. If I want the conversation to stop, I just say video production and then I kind of... That's about it. Yeah, Customs asked me that once over in Germany. They're like, what are you here for? What do you do for a living? And I'm like, oh gosh. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, because you don't want to lie to the Customs or border agent or whatever you call them. So then I have to tell them I'm a YouTube celebrity. I'm like, yeah, right. You know, I'm like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, same thing. It's all about context. If I'm somewhere where I've got a little bit of time, and I'll feel like going into it, and a little caffeinated maybe, then sure, we'll, we'll talk for half an hour about what it's like to be a YouTuber at a random place. But uh, yeah, most often it's just you know a, a throwaway, ah, do freelance video work, eh, or something, <laughs> you know, just something. Yeah, if I'm at the barber, I, I just want my hair cut and want to leave, and you know, I'm one of those folks. But yeah, it just depends on who it is and why they're asking. You can kind of judge that after a while, so yeah. You'd have the, you have a double whammy. You not only have to explain what a YouTuber is and does, but then you have to understand vintage tech as well. Not only that, but you have, you have yeah. to explain what type of YouTuber you yeah. are, because yeah. people do that and they're like, "Oh, you prank people, bro!" Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, do you do this or that? Do you make you know, vlogs and this, you, know, you know Logan Paul? No, it's like all these questions come up, and it's like, no, I'm not that type of YouTuber. And then you do go into the vintage computer stuff, and they're like, "What well, sounds?" Okay. <laughs> yeah. A, a lot of people that just have a high level view of YouTube don't fully see all these different niches that people do. Yeah. So like I was talking to someone one time and explaining this cool video I wanted to do and he, he was like, people actually watch that? And I'm just like, yeah. Followed by, <laughs> you can actually make money from this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the other thing too, like a lot of people are surprised about the whole money thing. And again, I, I highly encourage don't start a YouTube channel for the sake of getting rich. You'll get disappointed really fast. If it happens, it happens and you can work at it, but you know, have that mindset at the beginning. But the thing is, a lot of people are like, how do you, how do you make money if you don't have all these views that like, you know, Markiplier has or whatever. But the thing is, you just really need a small piece of a pie of a niche and you can, you can monetize off that. We have time for about maybe three more questions. And by the way, if you don't have a chance to ask your question, of course, uh, you'll be able to visit these fine folks at their tables. So, All right, this one's for David. Do you still use a heat sink to cool your TV dinners? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't, uh, because we got a new countertop and it's marble. And it basically is a heat sink. So I, I, like I just take a little drop of water and put on there, and I sit my TV dinner on, walk away, 60 seconds, come back. The heat has been dispersed. <laughs> yeah. Another question? Oops. 
I've got a comment. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, vacuum tubes, uh, one of the panelists. The fellow that teaches digital electronics at COD uses a vacuum tube analysis, uh, analogy with transistors because quantum physics is too, is too hard for, for, for second-year electronics technicians. It was a senior flunk out course at Purdue. I passed. <laughs> Any more? Oh, right here. Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, actually, a follow up question about kind of the business end of YouTube for you guys. Um, how do you guys balance YouTube monetization, sponsors, merch, and all that rigmarole? And what are some of the pitfalls you see in the near future for? being a monetized YouTuber for a living. So he's asking, um, how do you balance uh, advertising revenue, sponsors, trying to, how do you balance uh, uh, getting income from your, from your YouTube and what in the future may change or jeopardize or affect that? Ken, you want to start? I think, I think actually, I think you, you have, uh, I know you have sponsors. I'm not entirely sure uh, uh, David and Clint do, but uh, as someone who has some sponsorship, uh, could you answer that? Yeah, so the main source of revenue is from just the ad revenue because, you know, you don't need to then shove a sponsored message into your video. The Google magical algorithm machine will pick the ad that plays before your video. So that's the main thing I do for a source of income. But, yeah, I've worked with sponsors. I had an agent for a while, and it was basically... I went into it with the idea of, I'm just going to throw a bunch of spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. So I did a bunch of sponsored offer or sponsored things with a bunch of companies, even if I wasn't super into the brands. And then I just realized what I liked doing and what I didn't like doing. And then I kind of boiled it down to like two or three companies I'm much more loyal to. So I do those every so often. Uh, in terms of the challenges of revenue going forward, I mean... I don't know, I don't want to, you know, knock on wood here, but uh, YouTube is really, really big, so I, I hope it doesn't go anywhere anytime soon, but it's good to have multiple streams, so if you can do things like Amazon affiliates, you know, like, hey, I'm using this camera, here's a link to buy it in the description, you can get a commission from that. Uh, sponsorships, Patreon, Patreon is pretty good too, I've been getting involved with that more lately, so it's good to have a couple revenue streams. Okay. David, Clint, uh, any so thoughts on the future of monetization? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I realized early on that you can't probably shouldn't depend on one particular income source stream, much like Ken said, because you never know when one of those might disappear for whatever reason. So um, there's a number of ways you can do it. Uh, actually, I know some YouTubers I've talked to that actually make, make like the majority of their money on Amazon sponsorship or uh, Amazon affiliate sales. I tried that once, but it didn't work too well. Most of all, because most of the stuff I show, you can't buy on Amazon anyway. Um, so I don't I don't do that. But my uh, I mean, you could roughly make a pie chart and split my revenue three ways of Patreon and and YouTube AdSense and then my merchandise sales, which is mostly like games. I used to do T-shirts, which I'm going to get back into. Um, and of course, that takes a lot of work shipping all that stuff, by the way. Um, but yeah, so that's my three revenue st streams. I could probably lose any one of those and still get by. Um, so that's kind of like my safety net there. Um, I don't do sponsorships. Um, I, you know, I know a lot of YouTubers do, and I, I, I guess for me, I feel like uh, my patron. I get really good money from Patreon. I can't complain about that at all. And so I feel like I'm doing a disservice to the people who are supporting my channel if I start doing these ad sponsorships. And believe me, I get. Probably three or four times a day, somebody emails me wanting me to do a sponsorship. A day. A day. Yep. Wow. And I some of them are very lucrative. I've been offered as much as $20,000 just to do a 30-second integration into my YouTube. But I never do it, ever, ever, ever. And the sad part is, like, all of these people asking for me to sponsor them are stuff that is, like, not even freaking related to my to my content like why do I want to spend you know I, why do I want to put an ad stuck in the middle of one of my evergreen videos about some app on an iPhone or something like that I it just I'm just not gonna do it and um, now if I were to lose <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but I've always said, if I were to lose one of my three income streams, like if Patreon goes out of business or AdSense, they quit doing that or whatever, I, you know, I can always resort to that. And let's hope that never happens. Though. <laughs> yeah. And uh, building on top of that a bit, I don't do sponsorships too much either because you know, I don't like being on the receiving end of that. I get it. Like if people need to make people need to make a living, it, it's expensive to buy a lot of video equipment. So, <laughs> I, so I get it. But um, what I typically like to do is then like, hey, if you're on my Patreon, you get a version of the video that doesn't have the sponsorship in it. So it's kind of like an incentive for people then to convert to Patreon. But the other reason why sponsorships might be good for your channel is you get a flat rate. So if the video underperforms a little bit, you still get paid the same amount. In the AdSense world, if your video underperforms, you're gonna get paid less. But with a sponsorship, it's flat. So that's one advantage to think about. Nah, I, I got nothing, man. Hey, I don't do sponsorships either. <laughs> I just, you know, it's one of those like things where I, I, if if it were to come to that and it was no longer making a livable living, then sure, that would be a little tempting. But it's like, yeah, thankfully so far it's been okay without them. So I'm just gonna keep it going without if I can. Uh, we have time for one more question. So, so it's gonna be it's Mike. Michael Lee's co he's <laughs> the co-organizer of this event. The mic keeps the running microphones, Michael. Running. Uh, it's his choice. Oh, no. So bribe him. What's he going to do? Offer bribe. him money. Give him money. There we go. What have we got? All right. Um, thank you. Um, I don't know how much you guys are going to be able to answer this, given that you have been at this so long. Um, but I've got a tiny tiny YouTube channel as I'm sure probably some people in this room have and it's not retro tech but it is tech um, and I've the the things that I think that I, things that I've had the most su success with are explaining how to use game engines and mm, the one that had the most success really it was it was like it's like two or three videos but the one that's had the most success is one explaining a version of a game engine that Seems like no one else has explained, which is cool, but that's not really repeatable. And I feel like other people, those people would be into, or similar people would be into similar content. So I put out more, but it, you know, it dropped off and it dropped off. So how do you get the word out? How do you get eyeballs and people to even consider watching your videos? So to paraphrase the question, how do you, uh, how do you get new people seeing your content when it's such a, a crowded uh, space and you're in a very small niche uh, market? How do you, quote unquote, advertise your channel? How do you get new viewers? I can say that I don't know. Uh, I honestly attribute a lot of it to being kind of early in on that whole thing and getting a kind of accidental momentum going at the right time with the right content that's somehow connected. It, it's all algorithmic stuff with YouTube. I've never really promoted my stuff at all, except on my own individual social media things, and people already follow me there because they've seen the videos, so that feeds into itself at this point. And yeah, unfortunately for, for me, my only answer was I, I think I just kind of got uh, lucky in that respect. So I, I wish I had more information on that, but it confuses me as much as ever really i think i think the barrier to entry is a little higher now than it was a few years ago we all like you said we're kind of in the right place at the right time but in i could also make the case that there were other channels at that time i don't even know if they're still around or not that were doing kind of the same thing i i was doing but we're not successful and it's honestly because uh, their watch time statistics and stuff were poor because their videos just let's face it, weren't as interesting. They didn't put the work into them and whatnot. And so I think if you make good videos and some people will see them, they'll like them, the watch time will be good, they'll subscribe, YouTube sees this, they'll promote it. It's kind of a, uh, you know, a a feedback. feedback loop if, if the content is always good. But sometimes it takes a while uh, for that to happen. And um, you know, you can, you know, sometimes if you think it's a good video, you can go on a forum that might be relevant, a Facebook group or something and post it and people might watch it. And then um, people, you know, clickbait titles, I yeah. hate to say it, but it's something that actually is scientifically proven to work, especially for channels with low followings. Um, that's actually something I'm glad I don't have to do very often because I've moved beyond that. I have a, enough audience now that I can. And, and that's the other problem, too. Like, 
when I was starting off, I always had to make videos. Like if, if I was thinking, okay, I can make these three videos and I would think about like the titles, like what am I going to, even if like this one might be more interesting, but this one would have a good clickbait title. I'm going to make this one because it's going to bring in the views. But once you get your audience bigger, you can make whatever you want and you've got the audience that's just going to watch it regardless. And, and so, uh, and for, yeah. So when you're starting off, you do have to always keep that in mind. That, that you need content that's clickbait. And I also want to just say, I think consistency is kind of key as well. Just constantly pushing things out there. And the more of that that you can have in any kind of backlog for YouTube to start recommending your other stuff. Like if you've only got a few videos, there's not much more for YouTube to recommend, which means none of your new stuff will probably get recommended either. So, you know, the more that you can pump out there and just have a base that builds on itself, that's great. Yeah, and building on top of that, uh, I know this isn't super easy with retro stuff all the time, but if you can play off of current events, please do that, because search and algorithm rankings will help you just get discovered if you're playing off of a current event um, or news. And another thing, too, is, you know, collaborations are a good way to jumpstart your channel. I'm not saying, you know, email everybody and be annoying. No, I, go in with a plan and, like, collaborate with people, because, like, bigger channels, if they have the time, will gladly help smaller channels. I've helped channels that are really small before, and I, it's been cool to see them grow when we cross promote our content so look for collaboration opportunities that can really help yeah uh, we're out of time unfortunately we have to get ready for the auction I want to give a huge thanks to our panelists <laughs> Rick Green And uh, again, if you missed your opportunity to ask a question, please feel free to see them at their uh, tables out on the floor. So thanks again. <laughs>